Good morning. Good morning to you here in the room and good morning to you who are worshiping with us online. We are so grateful to have this chance to be here in this moment to worship God together. After this week, this is the place we should be to connect with God, with our faith, with one another. I want to uh, share with you that this morning is the last in our sermon series on the book of Esther and Mike Marcus will be preaching for us this morning on the uh, last couple of chapters. There are, what, just nine left to go, I think? That's just nine chapters. It's short. Um, but very timely for us to uh, conclude this series with uh, exploring God knows where justice is. So I'm grateful that you're here to hear that. Also want to share with you some ways that you can love and seek and serve this week or this month. Our Love Council, Mel Gard is the chair of our Love Council. She's sitting over there waving her hand right now. And we are still continuing to sponsor our notes of encouragement and thanks to uh, healthcare workers in our community. And we would love to have you be part of that project. So if you're interested in writing a note to someone who works in healthcare to say, we see you, we appreciate what you've been going through, and we are grateful that you've been sharing your skills and your commitment with our community. If you're willing to do something like that, I think Mel even has a script for you that, that if you need some ideas, uh, see Mel or see me, and we would love for you to be part of that project. Um, you can also uh, join a small group. One of the ways that you can seek this month is to join a small group. Do you know that Lent begins... Thank you. Wednesday. Wednesday with Ash Wednesday service, which we will hold, uh, hold here in this sanctuary at 530. You come for an imposition of ashes and a, a way to begin our Lenten discipline, our commitment to discipline during Lent. And our new sermon series that is based on the book by Kate Bowler uh, called Good Enough and we will, uh, our sermon series, our whole worship series will be uh, based on that. And our Lenten small groups will be based on her devotionals. Uh, that's called 40-ish devotionals for a life of imperfection. So I, I invite you to, to join a, a small group if you're not already part of one. I will be glad to talk to you about that. We're starting one, a brand new one, next Sunday at 4 p.m. here in person here at the church, and I'll be leading that. So if, if you would like to be part of that small group, I would love to talk to you about that. If you're already part of a small group that will be reading that devotional, or if you're not part of a small group but would like to read the devotional along with the sermon series, I have a, a, we have a prize for you today. We have a present for you today. Uh, a bookmark for you to take with you that, that shows you the readings that will be grouped according to the sermon theme each Sunday. These bookmarks are available here on the candle table up front and at the candle station at the back. So even if you're not in a small group, I invite you to read along with us, Kate Bowler's devotional, and these, this will help you know what readings to prepare for uh, each Sunday. A way you can serve 
Next week is our first Sunday food drive. And if you saw in our newsletter, our partners, the Hub and the Johnson County Multi-Service Centers, who will be collecting uh, for, the Hub is requesting bars of soap and deodorant, antiperspirant, shampoo, conditioner, ramen, and canned soup. The Multi-Service Center is asking for mac and cheese, meal helpers, jelly, oatmeal, salad dressing, and rice. Don't worry if you couldn't write all that down while I was reading it so quickly. Just check the newsletter for the items that are most needed. With all that being said, I'm going to invite you, if you would, to stand and share in our call to worship together. When the way is difficult and dangerous, let us still choose what is good and just. When evil comes to break us down and break us apart, let us still choose to carry on with each other. When power from on high strikes fear in our hearts, let us still choose the courage to persist. For we know that the love and power of God, which abides in us, will not be overcome. Let us remain standing and join in our opening hymn, O God of Every Nation. I think in days where everything seems upside down and tumultuous, it's good to remember the bedrock of our foundation. And so here in this moment, I invite you to share with each other what we believe in and affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. 
is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen.
this time, we would invite the kids to go to, with Pastor Geneva to Kids Connection. Let's give them a round of applause. All right. As they are heading out, we're going to start a little bit of a, a catch up here as we continue, as we come to the conclusion of our series over Esther. Uh, as we come together this morning, I, I want to kind of catch us up to the point in Esther that we are at. So I'll call it what it is. King Xerxes, uh, one of the main characters of our story, is a bit of a royal buffoon uh, who is sitting at the helm of 127 provinces of the Persian Empire. And one night while he's partying with some of his companions, he gives the order for his wife to come and be presented to his companions. And she defies him and is ultimately put to death for this decision. And so Xerxes puts on a royal pageant to find the most beautiful bride that he can to be his queen. Enter Esther. From all those who were present, Esther won the attraction and the affection of King Xerxes and was made his wife. Mordecai, Esther's cousin, who had brought her up as if she were his own child, urges her to keep her identity as a Jew secret. As time carries on, Haman, a noble of Xerxes' kingdom, grows to despise Mordecai because Mordecai refuses to acknowledge Haman's station and authority. He was so enraged by Mordecai's act of civil dis disobedience that Haman hatches this vile plot. He uses the power entrusted to him as a noble to bend the king's ear in his favor and tells him that these people, these Jews, they do not keep his law, and instead of tolerating, they should be eradicated. Not only that, but to sweeten the deal a little bit, Haman offers the king 10,000 talents of silver, which for us translates to about 340 metric tons of silver, to which Xerxes, who is emboldened by the veracity of Haman's accusation, looks at him and says, keep the money and do with them what you please. The king gives Haman his signet ring and allows him to write a royal decree in his name. Now this, this is important to our story, a, a decree written in the name of the king and signed and sealed with his signet ring cannot be revoked. It is final. Even a secondary decree cannot be a direct cancellation of a previous one. And so Haman gets exactly what he wants. It sends Mordecai into a state of mourning. He laments what is about to happen, tears his clothes, dresses in sackcloth, and dust ashes on his head. Esther in the royal palace hears about this and communicates with him to learn what is taking place. He urges Esther to protest to the king about what is about to unfold at great risk of personal peril. And perhaps the most famous line of the book, Mordecai tells Esther, who knows that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. In the realization of the situation she is in, she tells Mordecai to go, gather the Jews in the city of Susa, and fast. I will present my case to the king, and if I perish, I perish. To make a long story short, Esther approaches the king at risk of death and is permitted to make a request. As Xerxes says, even so much as half of my kingdom shall be given to you. She uses an ancient Near Eastern tradition of making smaller requests and smaller requests that begin to grow until she reaches her penultimate request. But by inviting Xerxes to a banquet with Haman, she then makes her final petition to the king, save my people. As Xerxes storms out in a fit of rage, realizing what Haman has done, Haman protests, but is ironically hung on a massive pole that was erected to execute Mordecai, his enemy. And so that is where we encounter today's passage, Esther chapter 8. On that day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, 
for Esther had told what he was to her. Then he took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. So Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet, weeping and pleading with him to avert the evil design of Haman the Agagite and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. The king held out the golden scepter to Esther, and Esther rose and stood before the king. She said, if it pleases the king, and if I have won his favor, and if, it, if the thing seems right before the king, and I have his approval, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, son of Hamadithia the Agagite, which he wrote giving orders to destroy the Jews who were in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming on my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Then King Xerxes said to the queen Esther and to the Jew Mordecai, See, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows, because he plotted to lay hands on the Jews. You may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king and seal it with the king's ring. For an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. The king's secretaries were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan. On the 23rd day, and an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews and to the satraps and the governors and the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces to every province in its own script, and to every people in its own language, and also to the Jews in their script and their language. He wrote letters in the name of King Xerxes, sealed them with the king's ring, and sent them by mounted couriers, riding on fast steeds, bred from the royal herd. By these letters, the king allowed the Jews who were in the, every city to assemble and defend their lives to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them with their women and children, and to plunder their goods on a single day throughout all the provinces of King Xerxes on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. A copy of the writ was to be issued as a decree in every province and published to all peoples, and the Jews were ready on that day to take revenge on their enemies. So the couriers, mounted on their swift royal steeds, hurried out, urged by the king's command. The decree was issued in the citadel of Susa. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king, wearing royal robes of blue and white, with a great golden crown and a mantle of fine linen and purple, while the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. For the Jews, there was light and gladness, joy and honor. In every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict came, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a festival and a holiday. Furthermore, many of the peoples of the country professed to be Jews, because the fear of the Jews had fallen upon them. May God add blessing to the hearing and the reading and the doing of this scripture. Amen. This past Tuesday night, I had an opportunity to listen to More Squared's uh, Metro Organization for Racial and Economic Equity, More Squared's annual meeting. This year, it was titled, For Such a Time as This. For Such a Time as This. Allison was on call at the hospital, and so Mallory and I had the evening to ourselves, and so I had my Bluetooth earpiece in, just so I was already logged into the call, and got Mallory in her pajamas and got ready for bed. And as people started to gather in the physical uh, portion of the meeting, St. James UMC began to play music. They began to play jazz. And as I leaned back in the rocker, she, uh, Mallory began to tap my chest and start to sign book, book. And so I picked her up and I lifted her and she picked one that was sitting on the top of the bookshelf that I had never seen before. And it was a copy of Martin, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. picture book that one of Allison's colleagues had lent us. 
And so as we flipped through that book, the More Squared meeting transitioned to begin a roll call of all the churches, all the partners in the community that have been working to advance racial and economic equity in our city. Mallory signed book again, and she pointed to one that she's never picked before, and I brought it with me today. This is called A for Awesome. A is for Awesome. 23 Iconic Women Who Have Changed the World. She flipped through the picture book, and as I was listening to church after church that was being called, I began to tear up, seeing my daughter look at these stories of historical and contemporary figures like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Emma Pankhurst, and Harriet Tubman. I began to feel this overwhelming sense of coincidence that Pastor Laura talked about during last week's sermon. For the first time in what felt like a long time, I felt a sense of peace. Peace that even in the midst of chaos and injustice that exists in our world, that as long as there are people who will continue to resist God's justice, can and will prevail. As the stories and testimonies of the work of More Squared began to pour in, hearing about the political successes, the personal victories, and the tenacity to resist against all possibilities filled me with a sense of hope. Hope that is, this is what is happening locally, happening in our backyard, that there are a myriad of people throughout the world that are also continuing to extend this kind of work in our world. 24 hours later, Russia's invasion of Ukraine began. And I wish more than anything over the last two and a half years that I could erase the word unprecedented from my vernacular, but my friends, we are somehow once again living in the midst of unprecedented times. The world waits and watches and worries as what seems to be the precursor to another global conflict begins to unfold before our eyes. We are no doubt moved with the question of what happens next. As Mark Twain once said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Haman, blinded with power and self-righteousness, makes a decision in which he does not consider the larger picture. He is instead moved by his own ego to reinforce his own self-righteousness. And I'm sure we have not seen a leader historically or contemporary that has done anything like this before, have we? As we see images of bombed out homes and separated families due to the decisions of a few, we cry out to God and ask, where then is justice? Where then is our hope? If the book of Esther had just ended with chapter 7, we have a happy ending with Haman being executed and the Jewish people saved, the screen would cut to black and the credits would start to roll. But justice did not stop with the moment that Haman was removed from the story. The damage from the situation needed to be dealt with. Xerxes in this chapter, he never admits his part to play. He never admits his wrongdoing. He never admits that his actions and his lack of accountability led to the near destruction of a whole community of people. Are we seeing some parallels here? Power left un unchecked leads to immense degrees of injustice. The permanence of a royal decree leaves Haman's vile plot in motion, even though he is no longer part of the picture. Xerxes gives Esther and Mordecai a chance to write their own royal decree and distribute it to the kingdom, which they must do with great haste. Imbued with the king's power, the two must write a decree that doesn't overrule Haman's, because they can't do that, but has to outmaneuver it in scope. Any lawyers in the room? That would be really helpful at the moment. Somehow, those who have been subjected, threatened with death, must once again overcome another obstacle that is set before them. And for such a time as this, Esther and Mordecai now control the pen that could not rewrite the wrongs, but amend them and change direction. I've heard a really good description of how policy and law and governance works in this way from uh, Rodney Smith. He's the vice president of access and engagement at William Jewell College. And he describes it like this. When you bake a cake, you add your flour, you add your sugar, you add your eggs, and you bake it. But once you've finished the cake, 
You can't take the flour back out of the cake. But you can change parts of it. You can choose the frosting that is going to balance its flavor. You can change its shape with, and color with fondant. You can do a great many things to take something that cannot be undone and turn it into something radically different. And that willingness to be open, to be creative, and be open to the possibility of change, that is hope in the face of injustice. That not all is lost. That there can be positive change, even in the midst of difficult, seemingly impossible circumstances. As I put Mallory to bed Tuesday night and I sat downstairs listening to the rest of the Moore Squared Conference, I was struck with this overwhelming sense of hope. I was struck by an acknowledgement that we have a long way to go before that cake is going to taste right. Amen? But there is work being done by people who care by people who refuse to allow the Hamans of this world to have the final say, even at great risk of their own well-being. Hope, not as a platitude, but as a sense of sacred imagination that not all is lost. Sacred hope that goes far beyond our understanding. Hope rooted in action of our community to engage our leaders to create Things like the Safe and Welcoming Cities Act that was recently passed. Hope rooted in the confidence that as this global conflict unfolds, we are seeing Russian citizens risk great repercussions and st while standing against tyranny and imperialism that is made manifest by their government at great peril to their own lives. There are people who embody hope with their decisions, with their investments, and acts of resistance. People who say, for such a time as this, we as people of faith are called to speak out. We are called by our creator to be stewards of creation and to recognize the worth, the dignity, and the gifts of all people because that is what is right and is good and is just. God knows where justice is found. Justice is found where the people of God are called to action in the face of despair and adversity. Justice is found as formerly incarcerated individuals have their right to vote returned to them and their voice can be heard and accounted for. Justice is found when a country opens their borders to make way for refugees displaced by war. Justice is found when we do not allow the Hamans of this world to have the final say. Justice is found when the well-being of people is placed higher than one's stature or authority for the sake of yet another meaningless conquest. Justice seems like a vertical cliff to scale, but the work of justice is not done in a vacuum. Esther and Mordecai craft a statement and all the king's horses and all the king's men race to spread a royal edict again. This time, the decree that is crafted and distributed gives Jews the right to defend themselves, which they were not given under Haman's edict. Under Haman's edict, if there is a power that goes beyond you, that you have no control over, and it threatens all people that may look like you, sound like you, share similar beliefs as you, you have to lie down and take it, lest you befall the same fate as others with whom you associate. Sounds a little familiar still, doesn't it? The new decree crafted in this situation proposes something different, that you have the right to defend yourself. You may repel those who would cause harm to you. This motion effectively neutralizes Haman's decree without revoking it, because again, that's not allowed in Persian law, but rather it will be a fair fight between equal forces. And that seems strange to us, perhaps, how the scripture describes this situation because we don't want to think about another bloody conflict forming. But given this situation that they were in, Esther and Mordecai found a way to completely change the hand that had been dealt to them using the tools that were available to them. As we look at organizations in our community like More Squared that continue to do this work, advocating for racial and economic equity, we see the story of Esther as legislative changes on the local level create significant impacts for the livelihood of people, 
due to representative voices on city commissions, we can see where justice is found. In my own work at Reconciliation Services, we see how a partnership with a community that has experienced historic disinvestment and discrimination can lead to mutual transformation and justice can be found. And as countries open their borders and condemn the actions of others so that those displaced by conflict can find refuge and hope to bring a peaceful end to a conflict, justice can be found. In the action of people who have heard the call of equity and the well-being of creation, justice can be found. As the Moore Squared Conference came to a conclusion, one of the closing pieces was a panel of high school aged students from the metro area who had spent time doing significant research about policies and decisions that directly cause harm to our neighbors. After presenting these claims and challenging those who were present to be aware of these realities, they asked Mayor Quentin Lucas and Councilman Melissa Robinson for their support of legislation that, <clears throat> that values the worth, dignity, and gifts of all people to which they resoundingly agreed. The action of the people in the book of Esther is what leads to justice. And while the book of Esther, as we've been talking about through this series, never explicitly says the word God, God's presence, exists within God's people. It exists within the testimony of Esther and Mordecai and the situations that brought them to a moment in time where they were able to make decisions that would embody justice. For such a time as this, we are called to do the same. We are called to have that sense of hope, have that sense of sacred imagination that yes, things do not always look beautiful and shiny and perfect, but they can be transformed. They can be, they can have new life. We, as people of God, are called to be aware of the realities and the difficulties and the adversity that is present in our world, but we are also called to resist. Not just with a violent taking up of arms, but with our voices in our communities of accountability where our voice carries weight and even places where it doesn't. Because we don't want to sit on the sidelines when something like this occurs. For such a time as this, we are called to be those beacons of hope so that we may share with the world what justice can look like. As our hymn said today, what peace and love over conflict can look like. That book that Mallory picked out was, has a really great conclusion. I like it. As it goes through, every person, every letter of the alphabet, they have a different figure that they share. Some historical, some contemporary, some uh, pop culture. But I think the ending's my favorite. I'd like to read it for you guys. And X, Y, and Z are for extraordinary you and the zillions of brilliant, brave adventures that you will have. May it be so. Amen. At this time, as we enter a time of reflection and a time to give back, I invite all of us be aware of the space that we are in. Be aware of how your senses root you in this space. As the music plays, as we come forward and light a candle, let that flame feel the heat. Let that flame flicker and flow. And be reminded that we have one candle on both stations in the front and back of the room for you to light. And as more and more people come up to light a candle, and that candle could be a reminder of hope for you. It could be something that you resonated with in the story. Whatever you light a candle for today, see how the light from the table begins to grow as more and more people take their turn, pass the light, and share it. And in turn, the light grows bigger and bigger. 
We also ask that as you are here today, and as you continue to connect with a place like St. Paul's that really works to advocate for the, the worth, dignity, and gifts of all people, that you would give generously and support the work of organizations like More Squared that we serve through your giving. There are ways to give on the screen and these at the tables. Let's go to God together in prayer and reflection and generosity. Amen.
Please be seated. And let's pray together. God of grace, God of awe and God of wonder, we are so grateful for the way your love surrounds us and surrounds our world, bringing us hope and light. Throughout the generations, you have been with your people when it seemed as if all hope was lost. And yet, through one small act, one decisive choice, hope is restored. Let us remember that, God, as we see the images that are coming to us and hear the stories that are coming to us from Ukraine, as we hear the air raid sirens, as we see the images of grandparents comforting grandchildren, of families fleeing for safety, of fear in people's eyes. And as we feel, feel our own fear about what this means globally, God, we heard for our siblings who are in Ukraine, whose lives are threatened, whose homes are threatened. And so today, we, we light a, a candle as an act of courage, a, as a way to remember that even one candle in a dark room says to the darkness, I beg to differ. Darkness is not overwhelming. Because God, we know where your justice is found. Your justice is found in small acts, choices, and decisions that we make every day. And so we cling to that today. We cling to that image of Christ on a boat in a storm with the disciples. And we pray that faith will be our foundation, not fear, but faith. And, and the fear that we might experience, that we can take that and shape it and turn it into an act of bravery. A word spoken, a choice made, a letter written, a decision made. God, let every choice we make be a way to light a candle of hope and peace in the world. And may we find ways that justice is there. Maybe we don't see it right away, but every small act can bring to us the hope of your grace and your love, restoring and renewing this world. We pray all these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, the one who taught us to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. Let us stand as we're comfortable and join in our closing hymn, How Can I Keep From Singing?
go forth and do likewise.